You're yes. welcome. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, for example, my favorite um, team sport is basketball, so I, I should say that uh, I have perfect starting five uh, in terms of the basketball. So I have five uh, gentlemen here in my panel discussion, and the first one would be from uh, Norway. It's uh, Odne Mittin, uh, uh, Total Innovation Incubator Manager, Technology Transfer and IP uh, Manager and Expert. Uh, at the moment, um, in the board, uh, in six promising startups, uh, at the same time advising uh, 15 or even more um, promising companies. So please welcome Odne Mittin. Welcome. And uh, yeah, here, here's, uh, take your seat at the moment. And uh, the, our, our next uh, guest is uh, uh, Sasha uh, Kelberry. Uh, he's uh, found uh, Groglass founder and CEO. For those one, um, who maybe don't know, well, Latvians should know it definitely. Uh, Groglass is a um, greenfield startup uh, built as a spin off from Nanotechnology Research Center. Thanks. And uh, in simple words, uh, Grow glass seems like no glass, right? You, you, you just simply can't see it. It's no, no reflection and, and other benefits that you will talk a little bit later about it. So thank you for, for being here. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Anton Adamovic, co-founder and CEO of a promising startup Conellum. First ever person from Baltics to be chosen for European Forbes top uh, 30 under 30 in the category of industry. By the way, he's still under 30, so and still energetic. Um, he's a high-tech venture entrepreneur, uh, sharply focused on commercialization, commercialization uh, science, and true innovations. Really passionate about having links between the science and, and the business and the industry. Um, next one has, uh, has had a really uh, one of the longest flights from our uh, panel discussion members. Mm -hmm. It's Dr. Eugene Buff. Um, you just came a few days ago from the United States of America, founder and president of Primary Care uh, Innovation Consulting, registered technology transfer pro professional, uh, certified licensing professional, um, has substantial uh, expertise in uh, many different fields, for example, healthcare, biotechnology, biotechno consumer products. I have uh, listed so many subjects there that Simply, we don't have a lunch yeah. until the uh, we don't have a time until the yeah. lunch. So, well, welcome Eugene here in Riga, Latvia. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, well, I spoke in the basketball terms, but uh, you are taller than me. So, welcome, <laughs> welcome, Ferdinand. I'm not the tall, tallest one on this stage. Ferdinand Bartels from Germany. He has over 20 years of experience managing technology business in Germany, France, UK, China, Singapore, and I'm pretty sure that I still can count a lot of more countries, right? Um, at the time, uh, uh, he's, um, um, he's representing, uh, uh, he's executive director of the board at the Innovation Network for Advanced Materials. So welcome, G great to have you here. Uh, so, um, uh, I have already introduced you and, uh, well, our, um, our format of uh, our panel discussion will be that First, I have asked uh, each participant of the pa panel discussion uh, to um, have a short five-minute introduction presentation. So I'll be really strict on this one. Uh, I know on some of you have slides in even, even like 15 or 20 slides, but I'll be really strict. And if you <laughs> take over the time, I will turn off the electricity. But for <laughs> first one, the first one, Odne, the floor is yours. Your five-minute introduction presentation about the subject of uh, going from lab to the market. So please, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, I'm blushing already. Uh, I'm not sure how to live up to that uh, start. Um, I started uh, early and so in, uh, up in a corner called Def uh, Defense. It's a military in Norway. I had a uh, hope. That, uh, that was a cool place. Uh, weapons, explosions, uh, machines. Uh, found out very quickly that uh, the, um, my superiors didn't give me enough space for, uh, for uh, doing new things. And my sub subordinates uh, wasn't very motivated doing things. They just did things out by order. So for me, I uh, moved further. Uh, went over to uh, my formal education. Took that in the Netherlands, in Norway. 
business economics, worked some years as consultant after that, uh, and went over to and took an MBA in Scotland. Um, at the same time, I actually found my place in life. I think that is startups. Uh, started there in 2004 and been there since. Uh, for me, it's the uh, energy, people working in it, uh, motivation. That is the driver for me being there. Uh, I try. Uh, I, let's say I have my own companies, and I have someone paying me for doing the job as well. Uh, I try to keep to a certain number of tasks when I'm doing these things. Uh, which is up in the uh, right corner. Uh, over to what I'm interested in. Uh, we are all, everyone, a product of our surroundings. I work closely with two uh, research institutes uh, and uh, industrial region. Uh, on one side, they are good at uh, uh, ICT uh, and cybersecurity, digitalization. Uh, on the other side, uh, which is Far off on the other side, they are uh, heavy industry, uh, manufacturing, uh, lean manufacturing, uh, robots, uh, light white materials. And for us, the uh, um, point where these two things meet are uh, what the industry call Industry 4.0 and uh, IT people call uh, IoT. So this is me with the tool. Uh, I've squeezed in between uh, hopeful uh, researchers, uh, IP owners, entrepreneurs on one side, and I try to transfer with what I can over to uh, something valuable, uh, either a cash cow or a greedy industry or venture capital with Mr. Burns. Um, in that process, uh, I try to avoid being advisor as much as possible and try to more be, take a formal position so I can be everything from project manager, uh, CEO, take a position in the board, being chairman on board, everything to make it uh, uh, run smoother and faster. Thank you. Just a short ending and maybe a start for uh, uh, the discussion in the panel. I just divided in phase one, phase two uh, here uh, uh, in a transfer process. Uh, as capital industry uh, customers try to make me and my companies responsible for the results and things that is done uh, with uh, com uh, complicated contracts, uh, earn out models, everything they can find, I try to make uh, researchers a part of the process and make them responsible, uh, responsible for the end result. Uh, being responsible for failure and also being responsible and have uh, a potential success what they're doing in different models. I think I stop there and make the next one. Thank you. Thanks and uh, now um, Sasha Kelberg from the Grow Glass, your five minute presentation. Thanks a lot, Renis, for introducing me. I'll wait for the presentation to come up. Yes. Uh, just in a minute. So the yeah. idea of today's introduction, the theme is from deep tech idea to commercialization. And I will start with commercialization part. So what we do is we take regular glass, we apply nano coatings on it to make it invisible. And people pay to upgrade their glass to be invisible. In fact, when we came out with our product in 2009, uh, to the European picture framing market, we had five competitors. Uh, there were two Germans, <coughs> a Swiss, a Danish, and an American. So it sounds like a start of a good joke. But uh, the joke is on them today, we have 65% of the European picture framing market. Now, the science part. Uh, what we do is the reflections that we have to work with are, are on a really small scale. To be exact, we humans see in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum for 400 to 700 nanometers. And in order for the glass to remain transparent after we've coated it, we have to go smaller than that, to one quarter of that wavelength. So what ends up happening is we deposit five to seven layers of alternating materials to the total thickness of one three hundredth of a human hair. And we have to do that to the 2% uniformity on two meters. That's our big challenge. Before this conference, I had to actually look up 
Google the term deep tech. And uh, I read that it's where the scientific discovery meets engineering innovation. So I'll say a few words about engineering innovation. Um, what we do is we do magnetron sputtering. That's the name of our process. And the uh, industry standard is to coat the glass horizontally, one side at a time. Our coding requires that we code both sides at the same time, and we solve the problem of coding it vertically at the same time. Now, imagine two millimeter piece of glass, two by three meters wide. It's like a fragile paper standing on its edge. So you'll have to visit us to appreciate the challenge. Now you say, great. You have a great product. You have it better than the competitors. You have it cheaper than competitors. Success, right? However, most of startups still fail at this stage. The problem is the world. It's not as orderly as uh, the atoms in the vacuum chamber, and that frustrates the heck out of the scientists and the engineers inside of us. For example, we're called Grow Glass because our plan A was to sell glass to greenhouses to help plants grow. And who could predict that we had our grand opening in October of 2008? Um, I understand it's as far away and most of today's entrepreneurs were probably just hitting puberty at that time. But it was not a good time to invest in new capital and open new greenhouses. And even if we could sell at that time, uh, our machine worked for three to four hours at a time. It was a first of a kind machine. And uh, instead of the 10 day campaigns, orderly ones that we planned for. Or imagine showing up one day at work and finding that your 30 million or 20 million technological installation has been eaten from inside out because uh, the worker on a night shift screwed up the acid concentration in the cooling circuit. Now, I could stand here all day and recount the times that I thought I would probably leave Latvia very soon and uh, never succeed. And I could also say that one day would not be enough to recount all the great experiences that these 14 years have brought me. Uh, but I don't have all day. I have five minutes, and so I will leave you with two words. Uh, the first word is pivot. And in basketball, it's uh, defined as changing direction by moving with the body while keeping one foot on the ground. And I define it in business as if you can't go straight, you better have enough alternatives and enthusiasm to move in a completely different direction. The world changes, and as they say in the military, even the best plan never survives first contact. Not that you shouldn't plan, but the plan should be robust to survive the real world. The second word, word I will leave you with is stick with itness. It's the word that our founding and original investor taught me, and this has been key to our success and to theirs. I read somewhere that it takes six to seven years to develop a deep tech idea and a business, uh, which is a sprint in my marathon experience. Uh, otherwise, the CEO loses her passion and the business loses its momentum. Well, I don't agree with that. I think that if business is the same from year to year, it will lose its momentum. That's why I'm a deep believer that a business should be reinvented completely every time it grows slightly faster than the economy around it. Second is that CEO, I cannot imagine a more rewarding challenge than to run an ever-evolving company and be charged with navigating the changing winds of the market conditions. So pivot and stick with itness. And I'll be happy to take your questions during the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And our next presentation is from Anton Adamovich. Your five minutes. The floor is yours. <coughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Anton Adamovich, and I'm CEO of Canel and Biotech. Um, I'll start about myself a bit. I wear two hats. One of those is CEO and founder of Canel and Biotech, and the second one is team of commercialization reactor. And I would like to focus your attention just there for the next 20 seconds. 
commercialization reactor, it is fair to say that it is the entity, it is a movement that truly forms the backbone of deep tech startup creation in the region. Up to now, we have already in our portfolio more than 40 companies that raised capital from outside and already one successful exit in 2015. So it's a very remarkable place where scientists and entrepreneurs meet together and form teams. And we help them, we accelerate them, and we invest in them. But about this, you will know more at 1 o'clock at the ignition stage, 1.30. Now let's focus a bit about my startup, my deep tech startup. And I would like you all to know that I am not a scientist. I'm an entrepreneur running a deep tech company, which might be counterintuitive sometimes. Uh, but what we're actually doing, we have developed the world's fastest quantitative microbiological diagnostic system. Without us, currently, the world has to wait five days for results, for doing routine checks at food production and whatever production. With us, it will be less than two hours. With already validated results, for some specific microorganisms, we can run a test in less than one hour, which is almost 100 times boost in speed, which provides sustainable uh, production enhancements for industry. So how do we do it? We merge very distinct competences. And we start with a unique test, which allows to fluorescently biolabel any cell of interest in any substance. So for example, we take a drop of milk we add our reagents and put un under our digital microscope, which digitalizes the whole thing, creates a full 3D image, gathers more than one terabyte of image data, and creates some sort of Google Maps for germs that you can see on the left. And then our AI analyzes it automatically and it identifies all the cells of interest. The precision of this is like searching for only three sea flower seeds in the tank that fills approximately 43 Olympic-sized swimming pools. So it's an extremely precise thing. Canelm is winner of Founder Games 2017, first place out of 2.5 thousand startups. And this was already mentioned somewhere. Um, what is important is that I'm commercializing science. I'm the founder, but I'm commercializing science of brilliant scientists. And right now, in this building, there are approximately 15 new scientific groups that will present their scientific achievements and look for founders. This will happen in the next two days. And I would like to give a round of applause for these brave scientists who took a flight from around the world, from UK, from Spain, from Russia, to come here and attract local entrepreneurs to create next big ventures. So let's have a round of applause for them. Important second thing is, what is my job about? My job about, is about not losing the momentum. Momentum will be a word that, let's say, everybody is going to use, I believe, in this uh, panel discussion. But, and for me, well, in order not to lose momentum, I need to find the right path on how to commercialize this piece of science. And for this, I need to rely on three points surrounding myself with people who are smarter than me. So, and we have accelerators, we have commercialization reactor, we have experts, we have industry that could help uh, startups to flourish. We have now in Latvia, since last July, 15 million for pre-seed and seed investment, which is, I believe, more than enough. One more important thing is other tools to acquire that will help me not to lose momentum in my company. And if with the first two of those points, it's quite clear. With the third one, let me focus on this. This is a problem right now across the whole deep tech sector, I believe, at least in Europe. So the problem is that some stage, startups need to prototype, prototype big. It might be after the seed round, but before industry is willing to pay for the product. Sometimes it's capital, capital intense. Investors don't give money for this. So mobilizing government, uh, well, this would be my message uh, throughout today. It's important to create those non-dilutive financing 
instruments for rapid prototyping for startups, uh, which is an extremely big deal. And for my company, let's say, this is what we managed to prototype without the um, uh, instruments, the public financing, and it took 40 hours to digitalize the sample. After raising one of public instruments, in 15 months, we got a system that allows us to do it less than one hour for certain microorganisms, and then digitalize the whole thing. And now the cherry on the top is that this public instrument, in some ways, guaranteed my company to sign a deal with Fortune 500 company last October to change their whole hygiene system, which is extremely important. So Anton, it's not boring, but your presentation will five lose seconds. momentum soon, right? So, yes. Okay, great. Potentially, this thing has implication on the whole startup life cycle, reducing time from birth to exit from six, seven, eight years to just approximately four years. This is my strong belief. And this is what the country that will crack this puzzle will have a competitive advantage in building its economy. So, and then for also for entrepreneurs to make the leap of faith from where they are now to stepping into deep tech sector will be much more rational and that's gonna change the whole economic uh, trajectory. Thank you for attention on this and let's get to panel discussion. Thank you. And other. Eugene Bach has a great experience in technology transfer and licensing and coming from the lab to market. So please, your point of view on, on these subjects, your five well, minutes. What, yeah, while the Oh, OK. <clears throat> the slides up. So I'm one of those crazy Americans that do like to have the audience participation. So I hope we will get this uh, uh, for the panel. That's why I'm on the panel, not just a speaker. Uh, and uh, uh, I realized that to, to get the uh, audience participation, you need to start saying unpleasant things to people because they will not respond if you uh, just say something that they know and like. So I'll start from the trouble, and that's what basically what I do. Uh, so there are a lot of trouble uh, in, the, in the technology world, and the companies, large companies are dying, technologies are collecting dust, and managers are not sure what to do. Right? So uh, the academia, that's where all the technologies uh, deep or not so deep or high, uh, all the technologies start in the academia or research institution, they have a lot of troubles. The industry have their own troubles, but what I think we care about more is that uh, the people who are supposed to make this connection, and I'm very often called them uh, as a consultant, I'm very often called by my clients as a psychiatrist or the translator, because I come from the academic world, and I'm now, uh, for 20 years, I'm doing the uh, business consulting. So I'm trying to bring a little bit of the scientific approach to this whole process of uh, uh, commercializing the technologies. And this is uh, uh, some of the uh, unpleasant uh, data that uh, we uh, haven't heard yet today. And the, uh, the story is that, unfortunately, about 90% of the startups fail. Right? So we all hear those great stories, but uh, that's only about the uh, remaining 10%. And if you look at why it happens, there is the uh, absolutely uh, mind-boggling uh, data that most of the startups, most of the companies fail because they do that nobody needs. And we've heard already today in the one of the key uh, note uh, speakers that he said that we need to answer the question. I put it a little bit more. The question is not enough. There needs to be absolutely need that the company and, or the business to perform. Somebody should be losing sleep over the problem. Unless that happens, you cannot sell anything. And there are a lot of people who don't understand it. So this is the uh, uh, very big um, article uh, in the last year uh, Wall Street Journal that they're saying, hey, we're losing, uh, uh, we're out of uh, good ideas. And if you start reading it, it turns out that we're actually uh, pretty uh, well educated. And there are a lot of things that happen. Intellectual property is piling up. There are more and more patents being filed. Uh, uh, capital is plentiful, uh, so what's going on? And they, uh, they came up with the idea that the reason of where we are seems to be uh, failing is that the innovation is a process of trial and error. And we cannot succeed in trial and error. You flip in the coin, I mean, there is no re even reason that it will be, uh, come down 50-50. So what we're trying to do is actually to redefine what the innovation and commercialization is. Uh, and uh, kind of my perspective is try to present it as a process more than the event. And if it is a process, then uh, you can learn it, you can improve it by going through it again and again, versus the invention or discovery, which is just an event, 
right? You can't plan a, a discovery. You can't put on your calendar that tomorrow at 5 p.m. you will be, uh, you'll make a discovery. But you can plan innovation and you can learn from it and, and move for, uh, for it. Uh, the, the other problem is that the um, academia and industry have very different uh, goals and perspective in life. Uh, and so this is about the goals, and the, uh, what we're talking about here is this little intersection between the two. But the, the other problem is that actually the academia and industry look differently in what they do. Each of them thinks that, that one is more important than the other. And the punchline that I usually uh, like to present is that the uh, key to understand is that the, uh, the whole this development, commercialization, entrepreneurship, business, innovation, whatever word you can put instead of this uh, in the beginning, it's all the game about what he needs, not what I have. And that's sometimes very uh, uh, painful for the scientists to understand. But it only works, as I, uh, as I said, uh, if you're trying to deliver uh, some of the scientific method, it only works if the loop is closed. If you're getting some feedback uh, from the information, from the data, and you can learn from that data to do something. And that's basically what's called the customer-driven innovation. There's another important piece, is that we now live in a situation of open innovation. Some company uh, can uh, agree with it, some not, uh, but the, uh, instead of uh, solving the problem, what I try to do is I try to prevent the problem. And this is what, uh, why I called my company Primary Care Innovation Consulting. Uh, so, uh, it, like we, in the medicine, we are moving into the personalized medicine. We try to prevent the disease, not to cure them. So this is what I try to do for the businesses. Uh, and in that sense, uh, it, I try to turn the uh, innovation and commercialization process upside down to move from the uh, customer, from the customer needs, through the troubles, and figuring out what they really want and need before you even start developing something. And uh, that's basically where uh, my company positions. So you have the uh, uh, basic ideas, you have the industry, and the, here in the middle, there is usually not that many uh, people or organization. Uh, we talked about the funding, but there is actually no support uh, for a lot of those activities. And that's where I come in uh, for a lot of small and large uh, uh, companies. So I hope this is what we'll be discussing uh, at the panel uh, during the day and tomorrow. Uh, but I think this is the most important slide for, for me. Uh, so take a picture, reach out to me. Um, I, I am all over the world, even though uh, some, most of my addresses are in Boston. Um, and hopefully we'll have the conversation of how to actually introduce this scientific process into commercialization of uh, uh, deep technologies. Thank you. And um, for your five minutes presentation. And, uh, and Ferdinand Bartels, with your big experience in the industry, you have seen uh, a lot of hopeful uh, startups with the question, so do you need it? So can we cooperate? So please, your five minutes and point of view. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, Ferdinand Bartels, so you came from the science background. I'm definitely coming from the industrial background. Uh, so I'm having about 20 years of experience, or maybe almost 25 years now getting older as uh, working for corporate companies, working for SMEs. Currently, I'm managing director of the Specs Group, which is a company that produces surface science equipment, photoelectron spectroscopy, tunnel and microscopes, and things like that. So in a, in a purest sense, deep tech, you would say. Uh, but here I am at the, in the capacity as head of ENAM, uh, where I donate most of my free time to. Uh, ENAM is a network uh, of uh, Innovations for Advanced Materials, so it's a network of companies and institutions based in, in Berlin. And we believe that world-changing innovation start with a fragile idea. So our approach is not the one from an investor that puts some money in it eventually, not the one from a corporate that uh, takes the idea and puts some money into the company. Our approach is that uh, Every idea at the beginning has a value. We believe it's a great idea, and we try to take a look at it uh, to see what's missing. Uh, can we do something? Because there are many elements that are necessary to make something uh, successful, and we try to see what's missing, and then ask the people that haven't had the idea, take a look at it again, and see if it still is a good idea after that. So we accelerate high-tech products by supporting them at the source. Um, we do that uh, by inviting startups uh, to accelerator programs and meetings. Uh, we do that because we have a lot of corporates in our network. Uh, we do that because we have a lot of research institutions in, in our network. Um, well, we are focusing on advanced materials, and uh, some of you might say, oh, there's no software in it. 
Yes, there's no software in it. Uh, we do believe that materials and things are actually still important. Uh, Internet of Things is something very interesting, but uh, without a good T, the good I doesn't make much of a sense. Uh, so we're working with materials in its broadest sense, everything that surrounds advanced materials. Uh, and uh, we do s startup scouting, custom events, industry updates, accelerator participation, access to database, and international network for our members. Uh, and we do have an accelerator program, which starts always in, in fall, uh, where we have a lot of companies invited, uh, a lot of mentoring sessions, uh, and uh, so we try to get uh, the ideas out into the market field. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, you finished your presentation, the last one, and I have the first question to you, exactly. Well, Sasha mentioned in uh, your presentation that you actually had to Google the definition of the deep tech. I don't know, uh, did all, the, all our participants of the conference did it, but uh, what would you describe with a deep tech startup, your simple definition? Well, Just short as an ice-breaking. So I, I, I'm not here, I'm, I'm not a researcher, so I probably yeah. don't have a really good definition, but I have something that is a symptom of a deep tech company, I would say, in my view. And, and basically it's two things. What I see is uh, typically a deep tech idea is, has a chance, opportunity, or is already patented. Mm -hmm. If you have IP protection, uh, that to me is uh, not the proof that it's a deep tech idea, but it's a, it's a sure indication. The second thing is that, uh, as far as I can tell, any deep tech idea has a universal, that means a really global value. Uh, it has a benefit for the people or for the environment uh, anywhere you use it, in China or in Pakistan or in Germany or anywhere else. So it's not something in the regional by its very nature. So these two mm -hmm. elements are indications for me that I have a deep tech idea in front of me. Can we all agree on this, or you have uh, any other comments or, or like uh, short definitions? I know Anton, you had some uh, like yeah. short definition of it. For me, a deep tech startup is a startup that is based on scientific achievements, mm -hmm. on some significant scientific achievements that could be either patented or kept as know-how, how or anyway become an asset in the company. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and then uh, if we talk about the deep tech, we already heard some of the trends uh, in, uh, in the keynote speeches, but uh, um, if, if I may ask, uh, ask our first presenter, Odne, you're from Norway, but maybe you can uh, tell about uh, some trends of the, since uh, a lot of countries there, you anyway speak as the same language, right, uh, Scandinaviska, but uh, can you say in your region or in your country, what are the top trends in the deep tech field? Uh, I would guess uh, the biggest thing is digitalization uh, in uh, ICT. Uh, mm -hmm. um, welfare technologies, uh, Nordic countries has uh, huge challenges with uh, aging population. So it focuses a lot, especially Norway has uh, aging population, so welfare technology is important. Um, I would say uh, trying to, that, that's a little level up, but trying to combine or learn between different disciplines. So taking uh, manufacturing uh, technologies over to uh, other sectors has been uh, just an example doing things. I think that's my mm -hmm. belief. Uh, Eugene, how is it uh, like from your perspective from the north of America? Well, again, I'm trying to uh, think, and again, I very often talk about the doing business globally, and uh, for many, especially large company clients, it really doesn't matter where the technology is coming from. Uh, and I totally agree. I mean, it should have the global impact. So uh, uh, for good or for bad, as we've heard in the morning, uh, is that uh, we're kind of on, on one uh, little uh, um, earth here, and uh, uh, the, the markets become uh, the borders physical and emotional and uh, uh, become very, very transparent. Mm -hmm. uh, so fundamentally, it doesn't matter where the technology is coming from uh, and where it's going, but there are some necessary things, and intellectual property is definitely one of them. Uh, so, unfortunately, there is still a lot of the uh, kind of differences and uh, ambiguity between different regions, and I think that's the, the main uh, kind of uh, factor that dictates those differences. Mm -hmm. Sasha, you play your um, game of business in the global playground. Uh, could you describe any uh, deep tech trends that you, you see from your perspective? I'll 
probably address the, the, the issue of the patenting and maybe the, that came okay. up uh, previously. In our business, I probably don't believe that much in uh, necessarily patenting. I, you know, we can lock up uh, an inmate in a prison and give him paper saying he can't get out, but there's very, uh, but yet we put walls and barbed wire to keep uh, uh, sort of between that person and his yearning for freedom. So I don't think that a piece of paper is uh, something strong that can keep somebody from wanting to eat your lunch. Uh, and so we prefer to establish multiple competitive advantages to build walls. I saw a, a slide earlier about building walls. That's very much about our business. And since we are in a business of making real things that matter in the world and that are, that are physical in nature, uh, I, I believe as a strategy to uh, evolve and succeed in the world is to really build these multiple walls around the business to help us succeed. I, I want just to give yes. a quick comment on that. Is that we wanted to I, start a discussion. Because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're starting the quarrel here, but I, I think it's very important for everybody in the room to understand that uh, I specifically said intellectual property, not the patent. The patent is one of the probably 30 plus different uh, ways you can protect your uh, technology. Uh, but by definition, to sell something, you need to own it. Uh, so there are different ways how you can prove that you own it. And patent is very often the wrong and the inappropriate way of doing it. But somehow in the public mind, it, uh, those two words become uh, mixed up. Yeah, and I, that's what I wanted to say. IP is what, what, what's a really important part. How you protect it is, um, might be your decision, but you have to protect it. In nowadays world where every idea is traveling so fast, uh, you can be sure if you don't protect your ideas, somebody in China will have it a second after and he's going to be faster than you. And there are many examples of great ideas and other people have explored them. Yeah, those ways from the uh, lab to market, which is the name of our panel discussion, are like uh, complicated and uh, they are so, so different those ways. Uh, uh, do you see some, some of the best recommended like a strategy or the way that you would say how to go from the lab to market? And you had some remark from, on the discussion, yeah? If I'm allowed to make yes, a little sure. remark. Because uh, from my side, uh, I, I understand the importance of uh, patents, but I, I have a problem to see, let's say, the, the possibility for a small company actually to protect uh, uh, and follow the person that's viol violating your rights. Mm. Uh, for me, my perspective, it's more important to have uh, freedom to operate, and there are other ways to get that than actually patenting, I would say. But that's my perspective from, mm. let's say, startup business. So, but I understand from a bigger company, Perspective, that's kind of the way of doing things. But from smaller companies, I would say it's not a way too expensive. But, yeah. but about, <laughs> about going from the lab, lab to yeah. market, uh, Anton in his presentation mentioned that we have some great uh, scientists. And, uh, for, and by the way, uh, could I please ask, well, I will not ask to raise up your hands, but uh, academics, students, researchers, could you please just clap your hands? C could you please show, show where you are? <laughs> we have definitely some of them here. so. Your, what would be your advice uh, in this ways from going from lab to market? What, what kind of would be your strategy, your advice to these people who will participate in ignition team and who will participate in matchmaking, who are just in interested and who are having a great ideas? Anton, I so, see in your eyes that you have the answer. <laughs> I have a pain, yes. Yeah. For scientists, uh, important thing to consider is taking their hands off of business de decisions. It's both science and entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship are full-time activities. So one, the day when scientist is thinking about commercialization and is doing uh, steps towards it in terms of, uh, let's say, tr trying to attract capital, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, he loses the grip with the scientific world. Mm -hmm. There is just so many problems that have to be solved, and there should be a specific pro. Uh, problem solver for this, an entrepreneur, mm. who has to be the central figure of taking all the business-related decisions. Yeah, and actually, it is a global trend uh, for the, in the past years to tr make scientists entrepreneurs, but the more, let's say, I live uh, on this planet, the more I see that the better thing is the synergy. And I've actually came from Hello Tomorrow conference a few weeks ago in Paris, and I 
I hear about this scientist becoming entrepreneurs a lot, but when I speak to early stage investors, when I speak to accelerators, I really see this fire in their eyes when they hear that the business is run by a person who is an entrepreneur, mm. who will take care about the business. But then industry members like Sasha or Ferdinand are like, you will just steal my scientific idea. No? Uh, you need somebody to, let's say, if you don't trust yes. starting day one, you need to build this bridge of trust. You need some maybe mediator, maybe entity that will uh, escrow this deal. Mm. Uh, in our case, in commercialization reactor, commercialization reactor as, acts as this bridge of trust. So it effectively manages the relationships between entrepreneurs and scientists. So that is my next question. Uh, uh, well, how do you define the roles? And, and uh, Eugene, probably you have ex experience on this one as well. How do you actually define roles between the scientific expertise, the author of the business idea, and the business expertise, business mentorship? Uh, so. Well, it's all different, and I actually want to kind of segue from uh, what you said. I think there's uh, the story about the company stealing ideas, kind of one of those yeah. urban legend. You know, in business, it almost never happened uh, because there are uh, people that are just too honest, and there's the only thing that we all have is a reputation, and you can just lose it once. That's one point, and another is that most of the large companies, they have much more to lose mm -hmm. if even there is a hint of the uh, uh, information that they're not particularly honest in their transaction. Hmm. But back to your question is, I think, uh, uh, kind of, I've, I've heard once, and I'm not sure if the people with uh, physics education will pr uh, confirm that, but uh, I was told that pulling is easier than pushing. Hmm. Uh, so, and I think that this whole idea, it needs to be turned upside down. So it's not from a uh, uh, lab to the industry. It's from industry. Uh, uh, industry should be pulling things from the lab. Um, and that's where the uh, roles uh, need to change. So the uh, academics, the scientists, they sometimes don't like to know what's going on in industry but because they don't like it because they really don't know. So if they actually have the relationship established, if they start talking to the industry, they will not help themselves but start solving some of those problems. And that's where uh, the, the division will be natural. So it's, it's all about relationship and also kind of on the same point is, uh, you know, the transactions are done between people, not the uh, companies. So that's back to your point of the trust and the relationship. So it's all about relationship. Mm -hmm. So if you set it up right, you'll figure it out. Uh, if not, whatever you have, it's not about the uh, piece of technology. Sasha, you would agree if it's all about the uh, um, trust, trusting, and when it's uh, about the cooperation between the business and the science field? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I don't know if I like to make a generalization that a scientist should not go into the boardroom or mm -hmm. that uh, an MBA shouldn't go into the lab. Uh, for me, it's about intrinsic motivations of each individual person. Somebody is motivated by making the next discovery and by making it better, yet someone else is motivated to uh, dig their uh, heels into a problem and, and stick with it for uh, 10 years or so and to make a commercial success. Um, so I think it's, uh, again, this, everybody will tell you it's all about people and I will stick to it. Mm. Uh, Odna, I know you have a uh, broad experience when l linking the university and the business and uh, with some of the spin-offs. So how, how, what, would you be, what would be your recommendation of defining the roles between the scientists and the business expertise? Um, in, in, uh, let's say my position is always difficult to really or to understand if uh, the quality invention really will work in, in uh, the industry. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, it's always, I, or I try as much as possible to involve the researcher, uh, IP on the side, entrepreneur calling to uh, as far out in the process as possible. So uh, he is a part of the problem, part of the solution, part of the success, part of the failure, as far as possible. So that means, uh, basically, at the early stage, ownership or a, uh, or a model where he uh, or he or she get a bonus on when you get to a commercial mm. point. Okay, uh, well, my next uh, and, and the la last section what I would like to discuss with you is uh, it would be the team uh, state support and uh, like sh how much government should help startups uh, or how uh, or can startups survive themselves just with the private uh, capital and, and what kind of challenges you face, what you m mentioned all in your presentations about the momentum and, and to do it fast and, uh, and so. So in general about, so we have uh, I think the industry representatives, the startups here, so from all the audience if I would say that uh, Government uh, should um, 
should help the early stage startups, the, the startup companies with some kind of legal framework or financial support. Uh, clap your hands if you would agree with the statements the government should, should help. Uh, actually, well, it seems maybe it was just the first rows, or maybe uh, it's because we are in north of Europe. But uh, <laughs> uh, how, how would you, uh, what, what's your opinion on in the government involvement in the startup world? No, if, if I can jump in, yes. uh, uh, I mean, what we're discussing is uh, very often called technology transfer, right? This is what happened with uh, taking technology out of the academia and bringing it to industry. So I can tell you, and uh, we have about 50 plus years of experience around the world of that. This is terrible business. It's not working. You cannot transfer technology successfully, sustainably. So that's why uh, we sort of came up with this definition. It's called triple helix. So you do need to have academia. You need to have industry. You absolutely must have uh, government. Uh, what kind of role it plays and how it helps, it's all different. Uh, United States, the government doesn't help that much, and it works. In Israel, government helps a lot, and it works. Right? So it's, uh, it's not about just being a part of it, but it's just understanding that without it, it will not uh, work. Hmm. I think yeah, you, you should also be careful that it's, you need a government to some extent to set the framework, certain, certainly for the early stages, for the way how to get out of the university in the, into the market, and you should be careful not to fall into the trap that uh, capital always makes smart, smart decisions. That's not necessarily the case. Multinational companies not always make smart decisions. That's also not the case. So I think it needs all three elements. Um, just relying on, on funding and money alone won't do it. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Yes. I, um, if I were an investor and I saw in a business plan that uh, the entrepreneur has government support in the business plan, I would probably decide not to back them because uh, the business should stand on its own two feet and uh, plan for any eventuality. That's not to say that government uh, support doesn't have its place. In particular, we have a place here in Latvia that we may, uh, the government support may be covering some deficiencies of our uh, uh, geography of our particular place. We don't have a cluster, uh, so to say, in a certain material science. We have difficulty finding uh, people, and so it allows us that extra competitiveness uh, to be able to uh, maybe act on par with our competitors in the West. Uh, but that shouldn't be a major part of any business plan, for sure. Mm -hmm. Anton? Uh, I would like to add that, in, yes, in the later stages of company's development, company has to be on its own. I mean, if it relies on government money, it probably has a problem. Yeah. <laughs> But if it's like 10 years yeah, all yeah. the time. <laughs> but in the very early stage of company, before it's on the market, mm -hmm. at some point they require some, let's say, financing injections to do things that investors don't give money to do. So one of important things I, I would like to emphasize here is in my startup uh, where we just signed a deal with Fortune 500 company, we know that the final product for them will cost something like 0.8 million to develop. However, we received a portion of money from them, knowing, uh, uh, let's say, as a prepayment, because this will solve their problem if we get everything together. And if you have this kind of influx in your company, money from Fortune 500 company as a prepayment for finishing the product, I think it would be extremely good for government to match uh, this, f to build this commercialization, uh, let's say, validated thing, a, a product. What kind of support will it be for the research? For, no, it's for not research. Mm -hmm. So before startup, before science is commercialized, the science has to be finished. Mm -hmm. So the money that will be spent is not on R&D, it's on engineering, basically. Yes, there are some things that have to be discovered. Well, you could, let's say, flavor it under different sources, so you can call it R&D. But really, it's transferring this science to build something now really unique in form of a product. Mm -hmm. So there is a very certain, uh, let's say, step-by-step -step thing to do. Because in my case, again, this Fortune 500 company has set the list of exact technical requirements they need. So we know what we need to deliver them as a product. Mm -hmm. However, investors don't give money to, for this, at least around here or in this region, because it's still, it's a pre-market thing. It's a bit too risky. They will take too much uh, equity if they do, and 
the dilutions that you undergo as a startup raising uh, different uh, rounds is at some point slowing your momentum. You get diluted, you have less motivation. This all implies on the energy of entrepreneur and, and the team. Anton and Sasha, I noticed in your presentations you had uh, some disagreements about the word momentum and about how fast you should do it. So do you have any uh, comments about uh, because you had a great point that you can't lose momentum if every, uh, every year you do something different, right? If, uh, if you have no money and then you have little money and then you again you don't have no money and then you have a lot of money, right? Uh, or, uh, there are probably as many definitions of the word as there are businesses. So yeah. our experience is that uh, by changing direction we could keep our momentum. Mm -hmm. And for somebody who's uh, maybe frustrated against the product, momentum will disappear fast. Okay. You, you already mentioned some challenges that you see in, uh, in, uh, when, when you talked about the government support. Uh, what what uh, maybe other discussion members would uh, see? What kind of challenges there is uh, uh, at the early stage startups or, or, or going from the lab to market and building a deep tech startup? Uh, what, what, kind of, what would be the major challenge uh, that Maybe someone should already know, and then, uh, yeah. Ferdinand, do you have a well, comment? Well, if I, if I comment on one aspect, so I think yes. there are thousands of challenges you have as a startup trying to get out there. So you, you have to lose the gravitational force of the scientific environment to get up there. You have to be careful that not one of the multinationals is just picking you up as a winter food too early, uh, but I think one thing very, very important is, was in the keynote speech from, from Anders, this 1114. Uh, if you have a deep tech idea and you believe in it, and... One, one billion, one billion yeah, and one billion. Yeah, the, okay. And you might get away with not caring about Africa, you might get away not caring about the United States eventually, but you will not get away not having a plan for Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's something that we see very often is not in the mindset of uh, mostly young people that start their companies and have an idea maybe in some organic electronic field or whatever it is. It might be not having a plan for how to deal with the infrastructure in Asia and the, the large number of people and consumers there is something you will fail. Mm -hmm. Any other challenges? I think yes. it's probably more for the later stage. So I actually probably can say two things that are, I, uh, I consider the main problem. Uh, and, and again, being an outside person, I know I will uh, hear some uh, hate uh, uh, mail probably from the entrepreneurs. But the two things are, as you notice, uh, as, as I mentioned, 90% of the company is doing something nobody needs. Right? Uh, and that's, that's reality. So before you start doing something, figure out uh, who is your customer, what they do, why you do, what problem are you solving. So that's number one. And number two be, uh, related to that is uh, losing or not having a focus. You cannot solve, uh, feed the world. You cannot uh, enter the billion dollar market. It, it's not happening. So you need to figure out uh, where you start and how you grow. So I think this is the two, uh, especially for the early stage, if you don't, uh, if you don't know who you're serving, and you not focus, uh, you'll fail one way or another. Sasha, you definitely know who you are serving and that someone need, needs your pro product, right? But could you name some, some challenges that you have went through? Uh, we face several directions. We have several markets. But as I mentioned in my introduction, the key to us was the ability to be flexible mm -hmm. and to address uh, things, the challenges that come our way. Because uh, rigidity in a startup is probably uh, equal to failure. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'll now uh, take a risk, and uh, well, uh, it didn't work to, uh, as I mentioned before. But uh, now we have a five. Uh, we had five great presentations and different opinions, different geographical point of view. So uh, please, audience, if you, uh, we have a microphone in the middle, and uh, just to uh, fresh up our panel discussion, do, do you have any uh, question to the? Any other panelists? You? Okay, great. We have a question there. Oh, thank you. My name is Marta Smirnova. I represent Rietmo Bank. And my professional interest would be for the deep tech industry. Several speakers have been talking about the uh, infrastructure, which is very important for the development of the companies and for the growth. Would you put some key points, what you are missing in the banking sector, what is really important for the deep tech industry to get involved in the Latvian market and grow faster? Thank you. 
Do you understand the question? <laughs> I, I, I think I, uh, I do. Uh, so I can uh, give you. Uh, I, I confirm that infrastructure is very important, uh, but unfortunately, let me swing into the other extreme. Right. So we hear infrastructure from the people from MIT, right, or uh, likewise, uh, and they very often forget to say that it took MIT 25 years to build the infrastructure that they have. Right. So nobody have this time right now. We, you do not have 25 years. We do not have 25 years. The business, the life goes much faster. So I would say that it's probably not realistic to start building infrastructure. You know, this is very kind of uh, Soviet way to build the structure and then fill it with the content, right? Start with the content. The infrastructure will build around it as you go forward. We are in a different scenario, so we cannot use MIT as an example how things should be done. Did I answer your question, Liv? Well, maybe partly. And those companies that you see you have experience growing in Latvia, do you feel like you need something more from banking or it is good enough right now? Well, it's never good enough, right? <laughs> uh, so good enough is uh, we all retire and go live in some uh, pretty island where there are no cities, right? Uh, uh, but uh, I, I think there is a very good momentum. And again, I keep saying it's all about the people and understanding that you don't need to have all the answers. Right? You, uh, you rather need to ask questions. And as soon as you start asking questions, there are a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of infrastructure, there are a lot of people who've been doing that uh, reasonably longer than the people in the region. So just don't try to build something in a, a separate place, something unique, something that never happened before. Uh, that's, I think that would be the wrong path. So use all the world infrastructure. That's why we have this event with everybody from all around the world. We're here. Right? So there is no need to invent things that are already uh, here. So let's just connect and start mm -hmm. uh, the discussion. Ferdinand, you had a well, comment? If I try to answer specifically on the banking sector, I don't know much about the Latvia banking sector. I know some about the German and some other places. Banking hardly play any role in startup worlds because banking banks are too conservative for early stages. They are not giving any money out. They don't I guess they don't invest in venture capital funds much. Um, so they have a little bit of an infrastructural role in setting up bank accounts and having international business capabilities. But in, unfortunately, at least for the German case, bankings have not a role in, in startup funding anymore. Maybe they did 20 years ago, but they don't have it today. Mm -hmm. They choose not to be a player in this field. Oh, that's right. I mean, the further development of the deep tech <coughs> industry as a whole. Uh, like, not the first seed capital or first stage uh, accelerator programs, but for supporting the industry and letting it grow further. Yes, Orne? Uh, I can just come with an uh, ex uh, example. Does it work? Yeah. Uh, uh, I see uh, uh, financial sector banks has been quite supportive of setting up a uh, fintech uh, incubator fintech systems back home and that's been quite okay my uh, personal experience with the uh, banks and financial institutions uh, <coughs> trying to involve them in uh, in innovation is not good at I said they are conservative very slow and very slow at uh, starting and testing out new te technologies. So I say the, the approach that they're actually into innovation by supporting and giving financial support to uh, incubation system is quite okay. Up to now, I would say. Do we have any uh, other questions from the audience? Yes, please. Yes, hello everybody. I'm Katrina, I represent Imperio. We are a startup and uh, we can burn um, all the actually waste and turn it into money. So we produce energy actually. Mm -hmm. So um, I moved from IT startup to deep tech startup. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me say that uh, my motivation goes down which, with each month. So just to encourage me and my team, uh, is it okay? Which is the okay period for deep tech startup to, to develop? Is it, can we count, and, uh, count it uh, by months or by years? So, uh, yeah, can you give some, <laughs> give me the encouragement? <laughs> so, gentlemen, <laughs> please help with some motivation about the can length I, with the... Uh, yeah, do it. Yeah, on it, please. I, I can come with a, a positive story. Uh, when I started in 2004, the first company I, uh, uh, I came in contact with uh, had the weapon security system for defense. It took 
13 years before they had their first sale. But this is extremely complicated. But they kept up. They were working, uh, got finances, and at last they got a multi-million contract with defense. So it's good. Everyone is happy. Just keep up. Work for it. It will come to the at the end. Okay. <laughs> Any other comments? Yes, I, Sasha. I, I, we also started in 2004, uh, and I would say that it, it's a long journey, and the way to focus and to keep your motivation is not to focus on what you'll achieve tomorrow or the year after or five years after, but enjoy it today. Um, I think today is really challenging, and it's fun, and you're learning a lot. Yeah. I, I think I, uh, I probably tried to counter-motivate you, but I think this is where some <laughs> of the regional, uh, uh, regional differences come in through. Uh, and the, the point is, you know, it's okay to fail. And the faster you fail, the better you are. Right? So that's coming back to all those uh, words, pivot and all the other things. That, that's a fancy way to say we don't know what we're doing. Right? Uh, so uh, if you fail, fail fast and do something else. Right, and it's okay. I mean, it hasn't been, uh, it, it's not in the European culture, the, uh, the failures are not rewarded here. Uh, and it hasn't been rewarded in the US for a very long time, but it's just coming from the places where the innovation is incredible. Uh, uh, that the, uh, the more you fail, you know, you get in the chevrons. Uh, you fail five startups, you're like a general in the entrepreneurship. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> there, there I have to add, because the, the difficulties for startups, like for everyone, is how to differentiate between a failure and just an obstacle. Uh, even an obstacle can look very high and you just don't see on the other side, but still is an obstacle. obstacle the wall is not so thick. So I think uh, to differentiate, you have to believe into your idea, of course, and you need advisors, mentors, people surrounding the startup, people that have an experience that can, can help you understanding whether this is a wall you can climb over or this is something you should stop. Uh, Anton, related to this question, uh, you as an energetic entrepreneur uh, in Latvia, would you describe, uh, is this a great momentum and uh, a great time to be a deep tech startup? Uh, let me put it this way. I believe that starting since last year, it's the best time ever to start your uh, deep tech startup mm -hmm. because of the abundance of early stage capital, because of accelerators, uh, let's say, making their mistakes in the past, now becoming extremely efficient. Uh, so it's up to you as an entrepreneur to recharge your levels of uh, motivation. And you need to obviously set some milestones then to become happy after achieving them. Otherwise, it's always an emotional roller coaster, the startups. Mm -hmm. One day you are feeling you're like a king of the hill, other day you're depressed and under the rock. So it's okay, just get used to it, that's it. Uh, we had one more uh, question there in the middle. Yes, exactly, gentlemen, right there. Yes. Uh. Hello, uh, my name is Sai Prakash. Uh, I have a question regarding the what the patent stuff. So, like you know, like I heard that most of the patents we do are like 90% are like useless, or it is like not the ready ready at this moment to use that. So, but when the market is ready, then. Uh, it, the, the patent will expire and it, some other person will use that patent instead of the one who worked hard and so much. Uh, did you got it? So then h what's the way to protect it? Like if I make a patent, uh, like I should use it, like when it, the market is ready. Otherwise when it becomes open source and like you said, like the Chinese, like they use that. So h what's the way to protect my idea or shall I go with like the Coca-Cola? Thank you. So we have uh, one question. Uh, How, well, what's the way to protect your idea? But there was one more uh, at the same uh, line or role or different, a uh, little bit on the right side. Yes. So we can listen to one more question and then we can uh, okay. end up with uh, our discussion. Oh, thank you. My name is Oksana and uh, I present uh, the investors we have. Um, we help uh, big businesses for banking uh, support. So I have questions about, um, uh, you ha I guess it was Anton who said about a couple of entrepreneur and researcher that have, each one has to do its own business. I mean, the entrepreneur should make the management and the um, researcher should do the, their job. So I want to know who in this couple gains more in terms of money. 
I mean, yeah, this is like curious the question. Lawyers. Scientist or entrepreneur? The yeah, yeah. The scientist the or entrepreneur. <laughs> Sasha the already lawyers. has the answer, the lawyers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but uh, let's start with the first question, yeah, Eugene. So I, uh, you had I, a I tried to answer very quickly. First of all, and you were very, very generous. Uh, because by the data from USPTO, U, uh, US Patent Office, only 0.1%, 0.1% of patents ever return the cost of their persecution. Okay? So it's not about being useful. It's just uh, worth something. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and as I mentioned, as we, we discussed, I mean, this is a very uh, dangerous misconception that everything uh, and everybody needs to patent. Patent is one of the ways to protect your intellectual property. And it's very often, especially in the current speed of business, when your product might be obsolete by the time the patent gets issued, uh, you need to spend a lot of time strategizing what kind of protection is important for you. And I totally agree with Sasha. I mean, very often, first to the market is much more important than any, uh, anything else. Mm. And you have your two, three, five, whatever years mm. of uh, being in the lead, and that's all you get. So this is a question of the strategy and talking and understanding what your real goals are. And then it comments about the second question, who benefits more? So in commercialization reactors model, it's an equal shared distribution between scientific team and entrepreneurial team when the teams form. So you could say if the goal is to do an exit, which it is, uh, then they benefit same. Mm -hmm. Any final remarks? <laughs> yes, I, I didn't pick up what you said, but uh, the only one that means it then is the capital. Maybe you said the same. It's money. You're st steadily diluted. If you uh, have a startup, you are steadily diluted all the time uh, until you have a small portion back. Mm -hmm. But it's better to own uh, a little of a big thing than mm -hmm. everything of nothing. Uh, I wanted to remind you, if you check uh, here you can, and um, get to know new people, talk to, to someone you see uh, here who they represent. Uh, if it's the industry, the startups, uh, uh, or general pass uh, organizers and so on. Uh, that's what you see here on your pass. But if you uh, uh, turn your uh, pass around and check that it's 12.30, then it's written networking lunch. So that's why I have to say that I have to close up our discussion. Please give a big round of applause for our panel discussion members. Thank you. <laughs>